possibly the most explosive idea ever to have blown the mind. Theory goes, if the experimenters had used wild rats, whose ancestors had recently faced the cutting edge of natural selection, then indeed they might well have all started off up at the top of the graph rather than near the bottom. So that's one possible theory to account for why these, these rats started off with such poor quality teeth, given that they could improve under artificial selection regime. The other theory, which is perhaps a bit more interesting, is that adaptations in one department of life are bought at the expense of other departments of life. It isn't possible to be perfect. And if you select for, for one quality, it may be that another quality inevitably gets dragged down by this positive selection for the first one. It may be that by selecting for high quality teeth in these rats, what the experimenters were achieving was indeed rats that had high quality teeth, but that might have had to have been paid for in some other department of life, some other part of the economy, the natural economy of life. Maybe the calcium that was used to strengthen the teeth in this line of artificially selected rats, that calcium was taken away from some other department of life. I don't know what it would be, maybe the bones. Um, and so the overall survivability of those rats might actually have gone down. And in nature, you, we may suppose that animals are optimized to be good at surviving in all the different departments, all the different parts of life's economy. Teeth are not the only thing that matters. Natural selection, indeed, is a good economist, uh, a thrifty economist. Uh, Nicholas Humphrey, my colleague Nicholas Humphrey, made up the following true story about Henry Ford. I presume he made it up. I doubt if it's really true, although he says it is. It's a very interesting story. It should have been true, even if it wasn't. Uh, Henry Ford um, commissioned a survey of the scrapyards of America to look at all the Model T Fords, the, the dead carcasses of Model T Fords, to find out what it was that finally went, that finally broke down, that caused them to be thrown away. And sometimes it was the wheels, and sometimes it was the gearbox, and sometimes it was the, I don't know, the steering, and sometimes it was the clutch, and sometimes it was the chassis. But the one thing that the survey of the scrapyards showed never, was, never went wrong was the kingpins. And so Henry Ford, with ruthless logic, decreed that in future the kingpins should be built to an inferior specification. They were too good. Now that's good business sense, and it's also good natural selection sense. Natural selection would have done exactly the same thing. If you were to do, like Henry Ford, a survey of, say, the gibbons in the forests of Southeast Asia, who spend a lot of their time swinging through the trees and no doubt sometimes fall and break their limbs. If you were to look at all the bones in the skeleton and say, is there, look to see, is there any bone that's never, ever broken? And sometimes the humerus is broken, sometimes the radius, sometimes the ulna, sometimes the femur, sometimes the tibia, and so on. But there's one bone, say the collarbone, the clavicle, is never, ever broken. Well, the clavicle's too good. In that, in that case. Natural selection would pare down, shave off some of the material in the clavicle. I don't suppose for a moment, by the way, the clavicle is a good example. I bet that breaks a lot. Um, but anyway, if there is a bone that, ne that never breaks, natural selection would shave off over the generations some of the material in that non-breakable bone, shave it off until it just reaches the breakability of all the other bones. Because the material so saved could then be passed on to other bones to stop them breaking. Now, this is, of course, a gross oversimplification. I'm implying that all bones should be equally likely to break. It's not as simple as that, because, of course, some bones are more vital for survival than others. But you get the, you get the point that it's possible 
for bits of an animal to be too good, too good meaning that they could be economized upon and the material saved could be used to build up other parts of the body which at present are breakable or fallible in some other way. Engineers design for economy. There is no such thing as a perfect bridge. No engineer will design a bridge or a plane which, which, never, cr which never breaks, which never, which never crashes. There's always a trade-off. There's always a, 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 a limit beyond which the bridge can't go. A bridge will be built so that it, it will withstand a certain level of stress for a certain cost and cost is always very important. The commission given to the engineer is not build a perfect unbreakable bridge, but build the best bridge you can for however many million pounds. And natural selection does the same thing. If it's possible to make an economy, natural selection will. Mayfly adults only live for one day. Most of the life of a mayfly is spent as a larva, that's the feeding stage of the life cycle. It then hatches into an adult, which is the reproductive stage. It's like a plant flowering and then dying. The mayfly larva flowers as an adult mayfly, whose job it is to just fly around for one day, find a mate, mate and die, passing on the genes that go to make the next generation of mostly spent as a larva and finally flowering again as an adult. The adult mayfly is built to a very economical specification, therefore. It's only going to live a day. It has no gut, it has no feeding apparatus, it never feeds. Uh, it's just a flying machine. It's just a, a drone which flies around for one day to mate and it's equipped only to do that. It's very economically designed. Here's another medical question which has a beautiful, elegant Darwinian answer. Why do we grow old? Why do we die of old age? Notice that we're not allowed to give an answer like death from old age gets the oldies out of the way, making space for the new generation. And that's good for the species. Natural selection doesn't give a damn about the good of the species. Natural selection cares only for the good of the genes in the individual that make the individual do the thing that we are asking the question about. So in this case, if there are genes that make you die of old age, why are they there? The approach I want to bring to you was first suggested by the Nobel Prize winning biologist P.B. Meadower, Sir Peter Meadower. Um, and it's a very beautiful and ingenious idea. Every living creature is the way it is because it inherited the genes of its ancestors and its ancestors by definition all survived long enough to reproduce and pass those genes on. Now, how many of your ancestors died before they reached the age that you are now at? If you happen to be a very young child, the answer is literally zero. None of your ancestors died before they reached the age at which you now are. But if you happen to be extremely old, the answer is nearly 100%. Almost all your ancestors died before they reached the age at which you now are. Genes that make you die young don't get passed on. Genes that make you die old have a very good chance of getting passed on because they get passed on before their possessor dies. So the generations act as a kind of filter, stopping, by stopping I mean stopping passing through to the next generation, stopping genes that make you die young, but letting through genes that make you die old. 
A gene that makes you die when you're 10 isn't going to have very many descendants. A gene that makes you die when you're 90 is going to have left lots and lots of descendants before it kills you. And notice that this is true even without assuming that old individuals are decrepit and senile and doddery and incapable of, doing, of, of, re of reproducing. Um, this argument would work even if we had absolutely no tendency to become less fit, less able, as we got older. Medowa uses the analogy of bottles in a chemistry lab or test tubes in a chemistry lab. Every test tube eventually gets smashed. It doesn't live forever. But there's no tendency for test tubes to be more likely to get smashed the older they are. It's just that time and chance happen to all, and eventually every test tube gets smashed. Now, if you start with an animal which is no more likely to die when it's old than when it's young, so we start with this sort of potentially immortal animal, just goes on living until it gets hit by a bus or eaten by a leopard or something. Now, if there is any gene that arises in the, the development of this animal, which has a bad effect, which is a, a lethal gene or a, or a sublethal gene, um, uh, and they always do, uh, if that gene has its lethal effect when the animal is young, then it's not going to get passed on so often as a gene that has its lethal effect late. G.C. Williams, the same Williams who is the joint author of the book on Darwinian medicine, had a, an interesting refinement of the Medower theory. He invoked the idea of pleiotropism. Pleiotropism is the effect whereby a gene, a, a new mutation, has more than one effect. Not surprisingly, most new mutations have more than one effect. This is because embryonic development is a complicated process and any change in the...